Um, I'll just be reading from this very short book, Dyke Geology, in the middle section as well. A dike, according to geology, is a sheet of magma born in a fracture. Dikes are best understood as the veins of a volcano, coursing hot and varicose toward the surface to erupt. Because of this, dikes are always younger than the body of rock in which they've made their home. Born differently than the mother rock, they make their presence known in rebel coloration, black against white, striped against mottled, crystal against sand. Dikes consider, geologists consider dikes intrusive formations, in part because they were formed underground until exposed. The first time you met my mother, we were sitting down for dinner at a place that served quinoa, where she believed she was to meet my new friend. As I shredded my chicken into a bird's nest with my fork, I bloomed in our secret. I flattered you over and over. Isn't it interesting that she works in sustainable agriculture? I smile and chew. You know, she says that bulgur is the new quinoa. I swallow and hold your hand underneath the table. When I look down, I am startled. Your white skin is darker than mine, browned by so many days climbing rocks in the sun. Dikes indicate that some significant tectonic event took place long ago. Either the Earth's crust reached toward each other, creating a mountain range like interlocked fingers across a table, or the crust pulled apart, thinning to the point of a valley, like the sagging blanket between two bodies on either side of a bed. Holding your hand feels like holding hands with a rock. That's how hard your calluses are, how fiercely your skin has vowed to repair itself. You tell me your hands change depending on what rocks you climb. Limestone and quartzite soften your skin, reducing its ridges to rolling plains. But granite and volcanic tuff harden it, demanding a ripple of stone hard bumps below your fingers. Sometimes when I take your hand after an especially hard climb, I notice it is crying. Clear drops weep out like morning dew. I wipe these away and remove my hand. I know your skin heals best when it's left alone. Dikes can be tiny, just a matter of centimeters, or huge, running for hundreds of kilometers. The Great Dyke of Zimbabwe isn't some leather-clad butch crusading against Mugabe, but a mark on the land that scours over 300 miles across the country. The dike ripples with deposits of gold, silver, and platinum ore and has been mined for almost a hundred years. From a satellite view, the staggered path of the great dike reminds me of scars left behind after an ACL tear, fissured brown things that stop and start. Kohala's windward flank is studded with dikes, which forced their way out of her magma back when she still erupted. Crawling out like too many spiders from a crack, they fractured her sides, forming faults called horse and grabbins, misshapen toddler words that crawled their way into geology textbooks that prevent rainwater from falling naturally into the thirsty earth. Dykes always have to make things difficult. In the 1894 issue of the Journal of Geology, a man named Henry Lloyd Smith took issue with Dr. Emmy e. Wadsworth's assessment of a dike in Republic Mountain, Michigan. Lloyd Smith writes, Dr. Emmy Wadsworth in 1880, as the result of personal examination, concluded that the supposed quartzite tongue was really a granite dike intruding the jasper. Lloyd Smith insisted seven pages later that the tongue had had to have been quartzite, upholding that silly old binary between rocks and crystals. Of course, a man would have liked to have seen a quartzite tongue, grains of that soft and iridescent gemstone glinting through the rock. History records very little of the gray, more somber intrusions. If there were stone butches, there may well be granite dikes. The contested etymology of the word dike contains, in my humble opinion, far too many theories. Some claim the term originates from the mid-19th century American dike, slang for a man wearing his best clothes out on the town. Others cite that bull diker precedes dike in print in a passage in Claude McKay's 1928 Home to Harlem, wherein the author conflates the term with lesbian. These same scholars point to the occasional conflation of dyke with vagina and bull with aggressive. No one ever points to geology, that rock that dared defy another rock in a radical kind of perpendicular. The first time I saw a bull dagger in the flesh was on a Tuesday at the Lexington Club, a now shuttered lesbian bar on 19th Street in San Francisco. I drove up with my friends, one dyke, one knot. We all used our fakes and drank pink sugar that could not mask the shiny tang of vodka. And suddenly we saw her, 
laughing at the bar more leather vest than person. Thin metal spikes sagged across her shoulders like those needles that refuse pigeons a place to land. She knew the bartender and both watched us drink out of the corners of their eyes, delighting in our obvious pretense. I sipped knowing she saw me. I threw my long black hair over my shoulder. I cocked my head and laughed too hard at almost jokes. I watched her large hands circle her beer like magnets, fingers drawing halos around its mouth. Later that night, I think about those hands circling me, my breasts, my hip bones, drawn so deep into me they become stuck, the force between us so great that you would have needed to slide us apart to separate us. I imagine her drinking me in, her tongue lapping endlessly in whirls and points, plunging like rain falling down a slope. Her hands draw pearly beads of sweat out of my chest. They jiggle and bob on my collarbone as I am shook. My tongue soon follows, gasping for the opposite of air. Lesbian, on the other hand, has an etymology as clear as do. Named for that Greek island, home of Sappho, who every scholar snaps to clarify very may well not have been a lesbian at all. They translate the pronouns of the object of her poetry into heterosexuality. They argue her verse must be platonic, her desire idealistic and devoid of sensuality. They say a contemporary Sappho would not have understood what it meant to be a homosexual. They claim she was actually a licentious straight woman and that scholars of yore who did not want a legendary poet to be a slut instead called her a lesbian to dispense with her entirely. They are embarrassed by what they find in a woman whose work they admire. They will do anything, it seems, to retrieve her from this genre. Before Sappho, all the people who lived on Lesbos were called lesbians and none took issue with the label. This has led to a dry inconsistency in certain historical texts where modern scholars scrambled to know that the male poet Alcaeus was a lesbian, but not a lesbian. This has also given a number of local agricultural industries access to unintended markets simply due to their island of origin. Lesbian wine, lesbian ouzo, lesbian commercial fishing, lesbian poetry. All of Lesbos doubles as an officially recognized geopark Deemed so, far, deemed so for its abundance of petrified forests, the broken bones of giant sequoias that once circled the island in green turrets. Of course, forests are not born fossilized. It happened by way of eruption, an era of angry volcanoes pouring magma and ash over evergreen needling canopies. The forest froze like a deciduous Pompeii, bleeding silica into the, into the dirt to make Lesbos fertile. Petrification, the geological process by which something organic becomes mineral, is the only known method of becoming a rock. Ash decomposes when it touches water, flooding the earth with silica that in turn decomposes wood and takes its place. And so molecule by molecule, a log turns into something jeweled. Any plant can become a fossil, from grizzled stumps evolving into rose quartz to the curled witch finger of a fern warping into amethyst. All it takes is determination. Bury yourself in ash and you can do it too. Over time and under stressed, petrified logs crack. No longer bark and fiber, their fossilized crystals cr crack into clean slices as easily as a banana. When left alone, petrified wood should be colorless, a clouded sky of quartz. But more often, it takes on the color of its contaminants. Exposed to carbon, it turns black. Chromium, a greenish blue, manganese, bumblebee stripes. Lesbos's Petrified wood looks like an open wound. Some stumps sport bruised purples and pus yellow gashes splicing their rings. Others look like pink eye, red eye, red veins radiating outward from the heart. Either way, they look remarkably carnal for a rock. In New York, I meet an artist who has triangles for eyebrows. She patiently buckles me in so that I can fuck her with a dick the color of amethyst, the most malleable kind of crystal. Her lips are the color of sandstone, and when I part them, it feels like entering a canyon at Zion. Both edges ripple into each other, and when I press on, what feels like a beam of light. The morning after, she admits she is white, something I was unsure of. I can't, feel, but I can't help but feel like I'm falling back into my old habits, but she is kind, and her lips are full when they purse around a cigarette, and I break things off before I fall in love. When I think about it, every dick I've ever owned looked like a crystal. Most frequently, amethyst, the first fluorite, the one that melted in the dishwasher, rose quartz, the one that I returned to you in a Trader Joe's bag, lapis lazuli. Thank you.